Muy buenos días, les damos la más cordial bienvenida a la conferencia inaugural del 18 Encuentro Interuniversitario de Estudios Europeos Europa, más allá de las crisis. Eh, nos acompaña precisamente para la conferencia inaugural el doctor Martín Paluz, de quien me voy a permitir leer una breve semblanza. El eh, doctor estudió Ciencias Naturales, Filosofía y Derecho Internacional. En 1974 recibió el doctorado en Ciencias Naturales y en el 2001 obtuvo el doctorado en Ciencias Políticas y Abundan Filosofía en la Universidad Carolina de Praga. Y finalmente, en el 2007, concluyó su doctorado PhD en Derecho Internacional Público. Desde enero de 2011, doctor Martín Palou es miembro principal y director del programa Baclav Javel de Derechos Humanos y Diplomacia en la Universidad Internacional de Florida, Cátedra de Asuntos Internacionales y Públicos. También preside la Fundación Biblioteca Baclav Javel y la Plataforma Internacional para los Derechos Humanos en Cuba. El doctor Martín Palou todavía en la totalitaria Checoslovaquia, perteneció a los signatarios de la Carta 77, fue su portavoz en 1986 y participó en la creación del Foro Cívico durante la Revolución de Terciopelo, noviembre de 1989. Después de la caída del comunismo, fue miembro del Parlamento Checoslovaco en 1990, secretario adjunto de Relaciones Exteriores del 92 y después del 98 al 2001, Embajador de la República Checa en los Estados Unidos 2001-2005 y representante permanente de la República Checa ante las Naciones Unidas. Dear Professor, we are very happy to have you today. This is a, a very important day for us. Um, so you are going to talk about, el doctor Javel va a hablar sobre la política exterior de la República Checa en el área de los derechos humanos, lecciones aprendidas y usos actuales. Su exposición va a ser en inglés. Ustedes pueden sentirse con la confianza de hacer sus preguntas en español o en inglés. Este, y las vamos a, a transmitir al doctor Javier. So, the floor is yours. Uh, muchas gracias, señor. Realmente me excusa. Voy a hablar en inglés. Uh, y uh, yo espero que esta comunicación uh, uh, sea efectiva. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me uh, for this uh, important uh, conference. Uh, what I understand, I think, is uh, the current state of the world. Obviously, the crisis in Ukraine is the first thing that comes to our mind in this context. But let me start from a couple of trivialities. Uh, we are talking about a phenomenon, uh, one phenomenon we understand what we are talking about. But we always uh, are in a concrete place in concrete times, uh, which means that things uh, are seen in this uh, temporal perspective, number one, and number two, from different places, can be different. And we need to take these uh, differences into consideration uh, so that we can have a productive dialogue. I come from the United States, where I teach uh, uh, a course with a long name. Human rights, uh, democracy, human rights, basic ideas and concepts in a historical context. And my audience are American and American students. So I'm permanently aware of this uh, tension between me as an old man with Czech background and American students that gives all seeing uh, the situation from their perspective. And certainly our uh, most uh, important concept is people and uh, uh, rule, uh, uh, government. Because if you want to speak about democracy, we need to understand what do we mean by people and by the rule. I can, in that uh, context, right away, remind this famous statement made by American President Abraham Lincoln, what is democracy, government of the people, by the people, for the people, that hopefully uh, shall not perish from the earth. Again, this statement was uh, articulated in certain situations in the United States in the 19th century. 
But we need to take into consideration that people is not something, uh, I would say, automatic. We have to think about it. Uh, people, I think, in all uh, contexts, uh, have two basic dimensions. It is uh, related to our past, to our common identity based on language, culture, habits, uh, fairy tales, and all of that. But at the same time, it is a project. Project uh, focused on our future. We are coming from our past and we are going uh, to the future. For that reason, we need to understand the world in which we are living. But first thing what we need to understand is what I would uh, characterize as the presence of the past. What are we uh, with our past in this current world? And I know that uh, maybe Czech identity is something uh, not very well known here in Mexico. Uh, so let me to start from a certain historical uh, reminiscences. Uh, so uh, the question is who we are, the Czechs, uh, how we happen to be here today with our agenda, Czech Republic, uh, exterior uh, inter uh, foreign policies of the Czech Republic and maybe in the area of human rights. I know that I have a limited uh, time uh, to make my case, but so I will try to be very condensed and brief, but still with basic facts. Uh, Czech nation, uh, Czech people, is a concept that appeared or reappeared in the late 18th century. Uh, if you travel to Prague, you know that there is a, a certain a more ancient history than that. But we were reborn in the context of modernization of uh, the Austrian Empire. Uh, modernization that was uh, uh, led, controlled, and driven by those visions of Austrian emperors or um, uh, uh, people who had their own concept of Europe in this moment. And we were reborn from below. Uh, Czech uh, nation uh, was short of aristocracy. Uh, there were some tragedies happening before. Uh, so the Czech nation, and I will uh, offer you actually quite uh, unpleasant for us uh, definition who are modern Czechs. This definition was written by a philosopher, and you also called the Czech philosopher of the 20th century, who became the Václav Havel spokesperson of chapter 77 in 1977. His name was Jan Patočka, and he wrote, the Czechs are a nation of liberated servants. They didn't liberate themselves. They didn't carry out any great revolution, such as that which brought the great American Republic into existence, nor did they experience anything similar to the French Revolution. Rather, they were liberated by an act of emperor. Uh, sounds strange, and I will come uh, to the concept of my encounters with revolution, our revolution of 1989 and a little later. But uh, obviously, there are many nations like that that operate within the framework offered to them uh, by the context. And these uh, great revolutions are revolutions, uh, but uh, some nations might have been liberated by the act of emperor and uh, still they're participating actively in their own way uh, in the process of modernization. Now I'm looking at the 19th century of Czechs. And uh, so the question I would like to think about is, what does it mean to be reborn from below? And uh, the concept that comes to mind immediately is smallness. Uh, smallness in terms of numbers. Today, the uh, number of inhabitants of the Czech Republic is 10.5 million people. So in comparison with this great uh, Mexico City, it's still a small portion. But the Czech smallness at that moment, as Jan Patočka, this philosopher said, was not a matter of numbers. Also, it uh, was a matter of quality. It uh, was a strange or tendency uh, within present within the Czech political behavior was a kind of quality. This uh, behavior was. Uh, uh, and in a way, still it is threatened by its own natural tendency towards closeness, parochialism, opportunism, lack of confidence. At the same time, its permanent need for self accuse and uh, self defense. Uh, having said that, uh, 
uh, Czech nation reborn from below achieved very significant positive achievements in the 19th century. Our association, association life, our um, uh, part uh, in the modernization in terms of economics, Czech lands uh, were producing 80% of output of all Austrian Empire in uh, the uh, late uh, 19th century. And so it was not uh, that at all, but it was always uh, influenced by this pandemic, uh, pandemic smallness. And when I see the Czech uh, political situation today, this element there is there all the time. But this smallness always needs to be compensated by something, by uh, uh, worldliness. There are always some individuals who try to shake Czechs out of their shelves to open the windows, to bring fresh breeze into their somewhat uh, uh, closed uh, political atmosphere. Uh, so if you want to understand uh, this situation, look at the uh, individuals uh, who are connected with this permanent cause for the greatest. Uh, the one I need to mention here is Tomas Barry Masaryk. You uh, have in this city his statue, and uh, Arendu Masaryk is here. Uh, so there is a certain relationship between Mexico and uh, Czech Republic, thanks to Tomasz Garimasa, who he was. He was a professor at university, and he always used to go against the currents. He was a kind of a provocateur, and uh, he also experienced that his windows of his apartment were broken because he was students demonstrated against him. Uh, he was uh, very specific for several reasons. There were all sorts of Czech myths uh, uh, circulating around in that period of time, and he was just going against them. Uh, he, he strongly defended the rights of women and struggled against anti-Semitism. He married an American and had strong personal academic and political ties in the United States. He became the founding father and the first president of modern democratic Czechoslovak state. And he was, uh, it was the history that was a very successful example of the uh, democracy of small states in the first half of the two decades in the 20th uh, uh, century. But uh, let's start with our uh, 20th century. Uh, 19th century was a long period of European modernization. Europe was the uh, center of the world. And uh, everything looked like th th this permanent progress will go on and on. And all of a sudden, there was a uh, World War, First World War, 1914-1918. And Masaryk uh, tried to understand this through his philosophy of history, and he thought that it was a world revolution, a really transformation. And he said, theocracy is confronted with democracy. He was on the side of democracies. Democracies win was, were winning in the end of the war, also thanks to US intervention uh, to this uh, conflagration in this final stage. And out of sudden, the vision of President Wilson that the world can be made safe for democracy and small nations can be safe and democratic uh, was on the table. The Paris Peace Conference made some decisions about the future political architecture in Europe, and we had Czechoslovak democratic state. But what happened in the 20th century was not quite consistent with this vision of the world. All of a sudden, totalitarian regimes emerged on the scene, so-called Versailles Syndrome, which was a problem uh, of Germany and German revisionism. They were not happy about the results of the, the First World War. All sorts of details can be uh, mentioned in this context. So all of a sudden, you have, you have this uh, confrontation between autocratic and non-autocratic government in the middle of the European soil, and German Nazism was certainly the most visible phenomenon of this kind. The Soviet communism was there too, but it was a little bit far away out, so we were not still very much aware of the consequences of what that was going to mean for us in the future. As to make a long story short, one of the problems of Czechoslovakia was its uh, people, uh, identity, uh, political identity of this population. I cannot uh, now go into details, 
but uh, Czechoslovak political nation was composed of two branches, Czechs and Slovaks, and their identities were also not uh, identical, same, they were different. But more importantly, there was a strong German minority in a, a, a borderlands with Germany, Czechoslovakia, and this, this was the card played by Hitler. And here now we can already be uh, comparing the situation then with our situation today. Uh, what you hear today very often in the context of crisis in Ukraine is appeasement. Uh, should the European uh, world powers to uh, yield uh, when uh, uh, some powerful ruler makes a claim that minorities of this nation are uh, uh, expressed uh, uh, in certain other uh, in other country and tries to find out a solution. Although Hitler managed to destroy Czechoslovakia, there was this famous conference in Munich for 1938, and uh, prime ministers of Britain and France, uh, they were uh, trying to preserve the peace of our times, as uh, they said. It turned out that the peace of our times with the destruction of Czechoslovakia was not uh, uh, protected, that it was only prelude to the war that started a couple of months later, uh, in uh, September 1st, 1939. And we had this big conflagration of the Second World War and Czechoslovak tragedy unfolded. The Masaryk Republic was gone, and Masaryk's successor president, Edward Benesh, tried to step into his shoes, but he was totally wrong. Uh, he didn't know uh, or didn't put into his calculations that his state uh, could not be restituted uh, as it had existed before the war, that the future will be decided by the results on the ground, by the situation uh, that would uh, follow the uh, defeat of Adolf Hitler and uh, the end of the Second World War. Uh, so uh, the, the story is that the policies of Dr. Benesch during the war uh, uh, were failed and wrong from the very beginning because the result of this, the communist coup d'etat and uh, 1948 and then four decades of our Babylonian captivity in the Soviet Empire. Uh, so we have a unique opportunity uh, to uh, 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 examine our own experiences and encounters with two types of totalitarian regimes, uh, Germans and Soviets. And uh, during this uh, 40, the, the four decades of communism, it was my time because I was born in uh, uh, this period, we certainly uh, experienced a certain metamorphosis in the 1960s, more easygoing in the golden 60s, as some people like to say, with Beatles and uh, Rolling Stones and all of that. And then also uh, revol uh, revolts and universities in the West and Czechoslovak 68. The Prague Spring, when communist leaders tried to uh, you know, uh, endow socialism, as they said, in human face, to do some steps towards modernization, transformation. And these efforts were stopped uh, in uh, August of the same year uh, by the invasion of Warsaw Pact countries led by the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union felt that they had legitimate uh, interest, security interests in all regions. There are uh, many complicated things I cannot go into detail here. Uh, nuclear uh, balance and all these features of the Cold War. But then uh, the question is, and it's already my question, and the way how to introduce the second uh, very important personality in our history, Hassel Havel, what you can do in such a situation. Some people decided to emigrate. Exile was an option for certain people. Uh, many people, especially from social elites, uh, did that. Most of people coordinated themselves with the situation because uh, this second version of totalitarianism was not that brutal. It only required certain uh, uh, loyalty of people in the regime. They still used fear as the most important principle. If I can use Montesquieu as uh, a, a guide here, and uh, the situation was almost under control of the communist regime. But there was also Pavel who wrote a letter to Dr. Husak, who became the prime 
uh, the leader of the state, then it has some problem, uh, existential problem with that. So there was an effort to find a resistance, how to resist that situation, how to live dignified life in such a situation. And this was the first step uh, towards the creation of Charter 77, spoken for people 242 in the beginning, uh, that only wanted to uh, make a human rights argument and to ask the government to have a dialogue about uh, that situation, and obviously pointing to the cases of human rights violations. This uh, situation is secondly also international context. Uh, again, cannot go into details. There was a so Helsinki process, which was an effort to find some sort of peaceful existence of states with different social and political systems. Uh, the final act signed in '75, and then uh, the phenomenon of Washington, Moscow, and Ronald Reagan in the United States. Uh, so, a sort of geopolitical uh, game uh, plays in that situation. I cannot resist to make this remark. Do you know? Uh, the history of that flagship that was uh, sunk uh, recently uh, in the sea, uh, Moscow. Moscow. Uh, it was a flagship where Gorbachev met with Herbert von Bush, for the, uh, uh, 41st president of the United States, in December of 1989. So the journalist then uh, used the slogan from Yalta to Malta. Uh, and uh, it was a beginning. Well, uh, really, the end of Cold War architecture in Europe and its implication on the world at the beginning of a new world. I don't know that I have to speed up, uh, but I still want to cannot resist to make one point. First, Václav Havel. Václav Havel was not a professor, he was a playwright. One uh, great British uh, sociologist once uh, said, a Czech for Slovakia before the war, it was a republic of professors. And then it happened that professors ran out. And when Czechs were given next chance to be a democratic nation, they had to be satisfied with the playwright. Uh, the question between playwrights and professors is much more serious uh, than you can think, because uh, playwrights have very specific and you know, ancient uh, traditions, specific relation public spaces. Uh, they have their own ways how to communicate with public. Was a novel playwright, successful one. And then he was an abundant uh, writer, public intellectual, wrote the letter to Dr. Hussard, first spokesperson of Charter 77. And then all of a sudden, he was the leader of the Velvet Revolution of the Transformation, uh, was elected the president uh, of the Democratic Czechoslovakia. So this comparison with Masaryk is very justified. And then he was a very effective world leader. He was the one who had a chance to address in very effective the US Congress, uh, was traveling around the world. Actually, I was here in Mexico City with him uh, in 1991, I believe. Uh, uh, so all of that is a very important part of the history. Uh, uh, so, small comment on the revolution. Hannah Haren, my great uh, inspiration, mostly, I would say most important political scientist of the 20th century, uh, said once or wrote once a very provocative thing. Uh, revolutions are not man made things. Uh, revolutions are historical events by excellence. So if you believe that revolutions make, uh, revolutionaries make revolutions, it is not uh, the case because revolutions are not man made things. Revolutionaries are those who in this moment of history to change in a, a capacity, inspiration, courage to act in a certain way. Uh, they are not, uh, uh, I would say, following their pre-created uh, concept of blueprint. They are acting and trying to bring freedom uh, to the world uh, if, if they are operating. This was the story of our Velvet Revolution. And so we were all surprised by the situation three weeks before uh, it started. I was still sitting in detention cell and it was not uh, imaginable for us what was going to happen. All of a sudden, it didn't happen. Uh, we uh, were transformed from dissidents to politicians and had to work on with our uh, limited knowledge, but uh, not uh, university experts and better knowledge. Uh, we had to uh, rather use empirical methods to be uh, led by our experience on the way of transition. Uh, so now, political transition of 
Čia nepamėt, kaip jūsų laiką, čia nepamėt, kad o, na, we are leave this distinction aside. The center we are experiencing the most important thing, transformation of our totalitarian system of government to democracy. So you could go to economic agendas, to the laws that enabled the existence of political parties, election laws, transformation of all aspects of life. As a lawyer, I would add that the concept of legal revolution is very important here. Legal revolution is discontinuity of the law. In the case of the revolution, there were certainly certain elements of continuity and uh, this discontinuity was coming only uh, step by step gradually. Uh, I cannot go into details. Uh, so uh, we have whole story of our transition to democracy with all flaws, ups and downs, uh, successes, uh, mistakes. But I think that in the end of the day, you can easily say the Republic is a democratic country with all the weaknesses. You can uh, attribute to democracies with all sorts of options or opportunities for populist leaders and all of that. But we are democracy and we are free. But then uh, the transition was not, not only taking place in this context. I like to speak about three concentric circles. This was the inner circle. Uh, the second circle was a transformation of political architecture in Europe. It was a regional context, uh, the discussion uh, how to bring together all these so called interlocking institutions, what to do with the Helsinki process, with the organization for security cooperation in Europe. Uh, what uh, is going to be our relationship with European integration, future European Union, and obviously what about NATO and uh, all of that. Uh, so again, all these topics can uh, offer us a tremendous field for detailed discussions. But uh, what I say is that now Czech Republic returned to Europe, we are part of all these institutions, so we have inherited all positives or negatives uh, in that context. But there is a third uh, concentric circle, global. Uh, the revolution was not only taking place uh, in our country, not only in the context of European political architecture, but it had a global effect. Uh, Eric Hobsbawm, British scholar, liked to call in the term short 20th century age of extremes. Essentially, that ended, started with the First World War, ended in 1991 with the disintegration of the Soviet Union. And now, then, what we had 9 11 uh, and all sorts of crises uh, uh, leading us from there up to 2022 with the Ukrainian crisis. And it looks like that this world is still in the process of profound reconstruction, again, with all sorts of choices, event situations. Czech Republic is a small nation. Uh, is uh, liberated once, nation liberated by act of emperors. Now we need to uh, accept the uh, state of history in which we are operating. Uh, there are certain things we cannot change, but still capacity of coordination should not lead us to accept everything uh, blindly, but to have uh, uh, policies. In that context, Czech Republic, I think, is not by human rights policies. Uh, we, uh, Czech Republic uh, is uh, driven by our, our experience with the past, which means that our solidarity with dissidents, with those who fight now in our countries for the same things as we did in, in the times of Charter 77, is almost a duty. Obviously, it can get into conflict with uh, other perspectives, with strong uh, political constellations. Uh, but uh, human rights policy is very strong uh, and, and it will hopefully remain so in the future uh, as a par uh, part of our presidency of the European Union in the fall of this year. Uh, let me to, uh, mention briefly very sensitive case here, and I know here in Mexico, this is our human rights policy towards Cuba. Uh, what happened in 1998, I was uh, for a minister then, the US uh, sponsored resolution. The Commission for Human Rights in Geneva failed. It failed because uh, South Africa was a new, very active member. Nelson Mandela was a good friend of Castro, uh, so they lost. And all of a sudden, I was at, uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, visited by Cuban dissidents, both from exile and Elizabeth Sanchez. He traveled there from Havana, asked, he asked whether we could uh, bring ball back to the game and 
try ourselves uh, next year? I immediately said yes, not knowing how difficult it would have been, how uh, challenging operation would be impossible it was. And I think my genuine lessons from this time are quite topical and important even today. Uh, I arrived to Geneva and learned that Kima, diplomacy was terribly effective, uh, operating uh, around the world, and in certain ways, and it would be surprising that I'm going to say that now, Fidel Castro was right that the United States was using double standards. That there was a one concept of human rights uh, for US domestic realities, and human rights as an instrument of US policy is driven by uh, US national interests. I would only add that this is true for all countries, uh, tension between domestic and international uh, context. But anyways, uh, I had to find partners. Of course, the United States was a very important partner because still the uh, President's administration operates in the uh, State Department. But uh, they had their problem by relations with uh, Cuba, the case of it, uh, economic embargo, sanctions, economic language. On the other side, you had Europeans, France, uh, Spain. They uh, had very different uh, uh, interpretation here. And key countries of Latin America, uh, including Mexico. Uh, so I was finding myself in Bermuda Triangle, uh, not being able to satisfy all of them, but in the task to convince them that there is something more important than resolve all these differences. That future of human rights and solidarity with uh, those who defend human rights is important. Uh, the strange thing is that we managed to win these games three times in a row. Uh, three times in a row, uh, we got enough votes uh, supporting our resolution. But Mexico was. I had extremely interesting communications uh, with the Minister Castaneda uh, in that situation. Mexico was always abstentions, and Mexico always had its own different uh, perspectives when it came to Western Hemisphere, Latin America, and everything. Uh, I don't want to comment on that. I fully respect that all countries have their own histories, our experiences, our positions, and duties to speak and work together. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes people like to say globalization and localization are two different ideologies that fight each other. Everything is seen from a local perspective, but everything has global consequences. And I think that this is the uh, most important lesson we can learn. And the fact is that we have to find a way how to live with our uh, different uh, experiences and backgrounds, and how to be able to effectively uh, resolve or be uh, able to address the issues that are common to all of us. We can start from climate change, we can go uh, uh, through pandemics, uh, you can think about the economic uh, future of the global economic system, and you can go on and on. All countries have their specific things, their own democracies, but the democracies, I believe, need to find a way how to do it together. Very last point, I hope that I've not uh, over uh, used my time, is uh, I sh really, uh, came to my mind today, I'm using it right away. It's a, a state of uh, multidisciplinarism. Uh, my own experience was, and actually it's, uh, it's illustrated by my education, uh, that we need to be able to go uh, beyond the framework of our uh, safe zone, of our expertise, and uh, communicate, uh, to communicate with others. So how was multi, uh, uh, Disciplinarist uh, per se, who he was, playwright, philosopher, uh, politician, all of that combined, yes and no, uh, but he was an active person. He was able uh, to uh, not only to coordinate himself in the situation, but start an action that was an effective one and that uh, left a trace uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, so this is what I share with my students uh, in the United States. I fully respect it. Coming from different perspective, I'm not going to indoctrinate them with my uh, Czech ideas, but I can be their partner, I can help them uh, to be better themselves. And I think that this is what uh, academic institutions uh, uh, should be doing in the first place. This great uh, uh, 
Ciudad Universitaria uh, is uh, doing here today and uh, uh, as we speak uh, and uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, looking forward to any questions, comments, criticism, rejections, whatever. Thank you very much, Dr. Panus. Indeed, you have brought to this table a different education background, but also your political experience. So you, you have a, a fine point of view of what uh, this transition of the Republic of Czech from, from totalitarianism to, to democracy. We got some questions here. First one, I will make two or three questions. The first one is what can be identified as shared values that help to build up a modern check. The other one is from a personal point of view, what is your personal experience in the Bracket Spring? The other one is how Czech Republic has managed to create a new narrative to look into the future from its past. And the other one is, do you think Russian have somehow the same shared experience in transition to democracy? Okay, so I hope that uh, I've recorded uh, all <laughs> the questions, so I will try to answer them. Uh, but if uh, I will forget about some questions, yeah. please remind me. Of course. Uh, first of all, uh, check character, check mentality. Uh, I think that uh, you can find a response uh, in Czech modern literature, for instance. Uh, Czechs, uh, uh, I think, are known uh, that they don't take themselves too seriously. Uh, that uh, they can make jokes about themselves. Uh, uh, they sometimes have a tendency to underestimate themselves. You can be turned into this uh, process of self excuses and uh, just joking uh, oneself out of a problem. Uh, but at the same time, and it uh, brings me back to uh, the second question concerning 68 and my experience. Ah, oh, yeah, yeah, the, 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 the this this one this already there. Look, this one. I was a teenager at that moment, and it was uh, I was not participating in any discussions whether uh, those who were uh, wanted to reform communism or socialism uh, were right or wrong, whether socialism was reformable or not. But for me, it was a blow of fresh air and freedom. I had a, in these three years for the first time uh, an opportunity to travel to the West to start communicating uh, even with Mexicans uh, in, uh, in the summer uh, summer camps in the United Kingdom and just to enjoy myself as a young person. Uh, so, 68 for me was this type of personal uh, liberation, great job, uh, joy that things were happening and that the future was not predestined and there was some sort of openness. By the way, when I uh, got back from my uh, second or third trip to the West in uh, September of 1969, and someone told me, told me in that moment that next time I would be given this chance in January of 1990, uh, when I was uh, almost 40 years old, I would have uh, found that uh, difficult to believe and very unpleasant. So 68 was a maybe illusion, a dream about freedom, uh, an experience uh, of real freedom, but then an uh, encounter with the political realities uh, of the world war. It was, uh, you know, some countries were then open to receive Czech uh, and Slovak uh, Immigrants, uh, but no one uh, was uh, ready to challenge the Brezhnev's uh, 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 claim that these territories uh, uh, are his territories and that uh, Soviet security interests must be taken into consideration first. Uh, so that is 68. Then uh, uh, the story. Uh, the other one, how Czech Republic has managed to create a new narrative to look into the future no. from its past. You know, we actually uh, have uh, collectively many experiences with changing of our narratives. Uh, Ernst Gallner, this uh, great British, uh, Jewish British uh, sociologist, uh, once said that in Czech lands the history happens twice. Uh, first, as a reality uh, in a certain moment of history, and then when it is rediscovered, 
be interpreted by historians. Historians were very important part of our uh, process of national uh, revival. Uh, so the Czech version of history with Hussite revolution in the 15th century, what happened uh, in the course of history, is part of our historical identity. Uh, so we are confronted uh, with our historical identity again and again. When I was uh, at an elementary school, we were given a uh, version of history that was the Soviet uh, version of it, led by propaganda ideology. And so we had to find between the lines in our other uh, you know, communications uh, uh, how to understand it well. Uh, I had a uh, brother of my grandfather, he was an industrialist, so uh, uh, he was in jail and got back and uh, was staying in our uh, apartment. That was very, un that was very unpleasant for me because uh, he was a uh, high society, so he spent in the bathroom uh, too much time, so he bought uh, that place for all of us. I saw my uh, uh, uncle for the first time in 1960. He was also serving uh, jail time uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the communist era. Uh, so if you had a, co a confrontation or communication with these people who are not part of this uh, building of very young futures, you started to have a different version of uh, your own history. Uh, I can imagine that the same thing is with Cubans. Uh, we uh, now published an interesting uh, book, uh, Hashtag Libertad, in which we collected 63 stories of individuals from very old people, the old lady born in 1930, and uh, to people of, uh, our, of young generation. So when you read these stories, uh, each of these persons, that is always how to uh, explain, uh, present his early encounters with this story. And history is magistra vitae. Uh, history is uh, maybe something uh, where people who have some special relationships with gods of history, like kings, uh, are in charge of making it, and all others have to take uh, what they got out of it. But I think that history is a very interesting thing exactly because narratives can change, uh, that you can rediscover your past, that the past is not all, uh, never past enough, that you can explore it uh, and you can find new things uh, in your past because history is a strange animal. And check uh, uh, encounters of history, I think, are a good example. Right. We have another question or two more questions. Uh, what do you think? are the main challenges for the application of a foreign policy focusing on human rights? Look, uh, obviously, uh, maybe I already mentioned that, uh, uh, double standards. Uh, and, but I, I don't criticize it at the moment. Uh, each state uh, has its own constitutional system, its laws and practices, and uh, levels of uh, its uh, uh, respect for violation of human rights and what uh, you can do if you feel that your rights were violated. They are usually protected uh, uh, by uh, courts, uh, and you can do this or that. And then, obviously, uh, there must be some common standards uh, for mankind. There is a history of universal declaration where the most important uh, concept, I think, in Brahma is the concept of human dignity. Uh, that the, the, the all human beings, uh, whether they were born in the past, are now living or will be born in the future, are endowed with dignity despite of anything that you can attribute to their own capabilities, actions, opinions, beliefs. Uh, and it's so easy to speak about that at conferences, maybe in churches too, but how to turn it into international practice? Uh, now we have a discussion uh, about the, the criminal individual responsibility uh, for those things uh, happening uh, in uh, uh, Ukraine. But uh, the question is how our institutions, international institutions, can be effective to achieve its goals. We can look at the situation uh, in our states and ask human rights organizations how we are doing. Uh, are we doing fine, well, or is it something going on here that is not uh, set clearly in public and not turned into a matter of public discussion? 
But then you go to international community, you have diplomats, professionals, they are enjoying to talk to each other, spending too much time talking to each other. And then the question is, what is the effect of that? Well, uh, I wouldn't say that there is a no effect, but uh, I think that there is a lot of things that can be improved. Right. We have some more recording questions, but there are some that are from topics of Ukraine. So the next panel will be on the so we will leave those questions for the next panel. Uh, do you think that innovation and technology developments nowadays are compatible with our shared perspective of future human rights? Well, uh, that's a great question. Certainly, uh, all these instruments we can uh, now use to communicate with each other uh, to get information we need. You can Google everything. You don't need to go to the books. So uh, the world really is uh, very much affected uh, by technologies. But obviously, there are so many uh, very uh, important questions concerning with that. We see that uh, the social networks and social networking sometimes is not the best uh, contribution uh, to a real uh, dialogue and a real search for the truth. I, uh, as a Socratic philosopher, I don't think that anyone has uh, the truths uh, in his or her pockets, uh, that it is not our uh, possession. We only can uh, be uh, in the permanent search for it, be tested by it, and uh, trying to examine our own experiences and conceptual uh, conclusion based on our encounters, uh, do the, uh, this uh, postmodern rigid uh, help us in that respect, uh, yes or no, uh, uh, free of expression. Uh, I think one of the basic rights in democracy, because if you want to articulate problems, you need to have a freedom to articulate it, to express yourself. And then now we are confronted with this in the times of the hybrid wars and all these fake news uh, uh, situations, uh, confusion between truth and opinion, uh, opinions uh, look like truths, uh, and uh, uh, all these confusions. Uh, so uh, the media can contribute to these confusions and we must be aware of it. The artificial intelligence is. Uh, beautiful uh, instrument, but it can be dangerous master. Uh, you don't want to become a servant uh, of artificial intelligence for us all people. Sometimes it's difficult. Uh, we went yesterday to the church, and instead of not on the door of this church, you had this coupon there. Uh, so without having uh, something like that, uh, you would not be able to get information. Uh, so then, there's a small detail, nothing uh, wrong with that, but I think that uh, this technique is a topic uh, that needs to be uh, thoroughly thought through, uh, debated, and not just taken as it is. Uh, if we coordinate ourselves with it only, uh, we can end up in some sort of Orwellian state. Uh, look at China. Uh, China is great in uh, having uh, cameras uh, everywhere and being able to uh, use these technologies for all sorts of uh, uh, reasons and objectives totalitarian states or authoritarian states uh, uh, like to have to control everything, to push everyone to coordination. Thank you very much, Mr. Polis. There is uh, one last question. We are running out of time. Maybe you could answer it. Do you think other slave or Slav people have somehow the same shake uh, experience and benefit in transition to democracy? Well, the, the good question how many uh, Slavonic or slave uh, nations do we have? Is the number uh, or list of nations uh, recorded somewhere in the world mind, or are the nations uh, historical constructions? I could uh, speak about the history of Czechs and Slovaks. In the 1820s, there was a serious discussion that there are two. Uh, the groups about one and common language, uh, and that so maybe uh, one nation, but it turned out that uh, these two nations, uh, uh, because of different historical experiences, social realities, and everything, turn out to be two nations. And if you want, uh, I can ask answer this question in our current 
great communications with the Czechs and Slovaks, between two republics. Mm -hmm. uh, there are differences between Czechs and Slovaks, but uh, I think there is no enmities. Uh, there is a real uh, respect for the otherness of the other. And so other Slovak nations, uh, the Poles are our great friends, uh, but Poles maybe are sometimes too big and in the, in, uh, in the past about controversies with them, but they are our very important partners. Uh, uh, South Slavic nations, Serbs, Croats, uh, Slovenes, of course, uh, uh, we have a lot in common with them. But obviously, the historical tragedies of the night uh, in the 1990s, when we were on the right side of the history, <coughs> some of them on the wrong side, the disintegration of former Yugoslavia was much worse than so called other divorce between the Czechs and Slovaks. Uh, so, and obviously, we have Ukrainians and the Russians. Uh, uh, so, uh, we may be speaking about that uh, uh, in the next panel. Yeah. But again, uh, these are nations uh, that are connected with us. There were political theories circulating around so called Manslavism in the 19th uh, century, and Westerners like Karamanich and Borowski, they because he went to Russia in the 1950s and he was uh, uh, struck by the reality of uh, the Russian Empire. Uh, so he tried to uh, uh, send these warnings already uh, then that they, there is a very different world out there. But I would be very cautious uh, not uh, to uh, build to uh, high uh, divisive lines, how uh, high fences between us as a Western Slavic nations and those nations who are all the East. And the last sentence, uh, you know, Czechs uh, have very specific relation with uh, Celt Celtic uh, There is a uh, maybe mythological historians have some factors around it that Czechs are not a poor, the pure uh, Slavic nation, that we have something to do with Irish, maybe a lot for beer and certain type of uh, uh, behavior. Uh, so, you know, the questions of uh, nations is very complicated. Uh, again, past, present, and future. and future. Thank you very much, Dr. Marci Palus. We have some greetings from Colombia, from Peru, and also from other parts in South Mexico. So, uh, los invitamos a que continúen con nosotros para la siguiente mesa en unos minutos a la una de la tarde. Mesa 1, Ucrania en prospectiva. Nos van a acompañar el doctor Alejandro Simona Roquete, eh, Bea Wonja, Martín Palus y la doctora Ana Teresa Gutiérrez de Sí, eh, Me parece que eh, la, la doctora Beata Wonja se va a conectar. Eh, va a estar en el Muchas gracias, muchísimas gracias.